Well, welcome everyone to another semester of Berkeley Demography Brown Bags. Uh, today we are starting off with uh, Lowell Taylor from CMU. Uh, Lowell is uh, uh, the Heinz Professor of Economics uh, in the Public Policy School there. He's a labor economist, but he also does a lot of work on demography. Uh, he uh, has worked quite a bit on what uh, and he has also worked on utility. He's also worked on uh, the demography of sexuality, gay lesbian, gay and lesbian demography uh, here. And today he's going to be talking about his new work with, with David, yes, with David Card, uh, on uh, intergenerational mobility, uh, following in some, uh, a series of talks we had last semester, we discussed before using new census data, using record matching, this kind of issues of record linking. So we're just delighted to have them here. Uh, Lowell is vis visiting uh, Berkeley for the semester, and I'm very happy that he agreed. Uh, for, uh, we are putting a lot of pressure on him. Please be our first person. So that you're <laughs> yeah. here. And uh, we can get to know you right from the beginning and take advantage of your whole semester here. So thanks so much for coming. Uh, we look forward to the talk. All right, good. Well, thank you. And I was uh, also visiting, um, uh, some of you remember, uh, four years ago. And so many of you are familiar faces, so I'm glad to be back. Um, and uh, I, I was told that, 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 that I was going to be recorded. I somehow had it in my mind that I was going to be live broadcast. So, so I prepared a joke, but now it's not going to work. <laughs> but OK, well, here's a joke anyway. I was just going to say, like, this is the, the biggest demography seminar ever, uh, both, period, <laughs> both in person and around the globe, but now, see, now it's just a word. Um, uh, demography, uh, okay. Um, so, uh, <laughs> um, intergenerational transmission of human capital, so this is, this is like work that's just barely uh, getting off the ground, and so you'll, you'll excuse me if it's, it's a little bit rough. Um, but it is a project uh, that I'm pretty excited about, so, and, and I think uh, David is as well. And Cyprian Damasuro is a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon, who's uh, terrific, and, and we're glad to have him working on the project. So the, the basic idea here is, is not uh, hard to uh, motivate. Um, we think of ourselves in the U.S. as a, a land of opportunity, a place where in the 18th and 19th century, when people arrived, they didn't have the aristocracy that they had left in Europe. And, this is a place where people could make good, even if they came from modest circumstances. Um, and, and we hope to still be that society. Um, there's a very uh, important literature in sociology and, and, and economics on, on this topic. Um, you know, stretching back maybe 50 years, there's the, the Coleman Report, the, the Jenks Report, mm -hmm. uh, that they got, uh, you know, still get a, a lot of attention and still generate uh, a debate. Actually, when I was looking at the Jenks Report, it reminded how controversial it was seemed at the time. Um, uh, and then, you know, Becker and Tomes and, and Glenn Lowry uh, were, were among the many economists that were kind of working on this topic as well. The, the, the Lowry paper is kind of my favorite of the, of the bunch from this era, sort of talking about how we should expect parental resources to matter for what happens to their kids and how interventions by society might create long-run creative improvements to society. So this is, it does seem like a pretty important topic. Now, on the empirical front, what, what you want to do if you're looking at, at the intergenerational mobility, how people rise from, from, from being kind of low in the socioeconomic status to doing really well, is, is I think you want to look at, at how uh, parents are linked to children. And, and there have been some, some studies, a stream of studies, um, uh, over the last uh, uh, you know, 20 years or so, um, starting with this, this really famous paper by Gary Solon, um, uh, ju justifiably uh, a, a well-regarded paper. Um, <laughs> It's a little hard now in the era of big data to remind ourselves that this was a study with, with 382 father-son pairs. Um, it wasn't uh, 348, I guess, uh, father-son pairs. So, uh, you know, they, they, he was making a, a lot out of a, a, a relatively modest sample. Um, subsequent work has, has used somewhat big, bigger data set, but like this, this paper by Bosch um, and Mazumdar um, has 3,000 observations, um, which, is, which is better, and, and now allows them to do things like look at racial differences in, in, in mobility. But, but even there, I mean, my, my recollection is that like 60% of the um, income records had to be imputed, and I mean, it, you know, people have been working along with, with uh, small data uh, until uh, <laughs> Raj Chetty. So uh, uh, the Equality of Opportunity Project, this, this fantastic work, this is the kind of a target that we're, we're headed for. We'd like to be able to do stuff um, as would everybody. 
as good as Raj. Um, and his many uh, outstanding co-authors, um, including uh, Pat Klein, who's a co-author of one of these, uh, kind of the, the one that's some, a little bit more similar to what we're doing. So I think uh, most folks here know they have IRS records, which means they have uh, big data. Um, and they, they're able, uh, through Social Security numbers, to link uh, parents and children, so that's good. Um, the, the one thing you'll see that we, we can do that, that these guys can't do is they don't know anything about education. Um, um, or at least not much about education, although now we have a new paper um, where they, they spot kids that, that got, um, uh, that they show them in college, um, and, and they don't know uh, much about race, and they don't really know anything about parents' education, so there's, there are things that they, they can't do that, that we're, we're going to be able to do, uh, but, but that's, that's the kind of uh, a, a, a neat thing that we, we sort of like to be able to uh, do with, with uh, other data. Um, they also only can look at the current period, given the data starts when it does. So. Right, so they're looking at at, 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 at young people. Um, we, we don't want to rag on them for that, because we're going to do the same thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> recent cohorts. Recent cohorts, yeah. different than young people. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, if they look at a recent cohort, yeah, right. Um, uh, uh, yeah, and then there's there's this there's this nice stream of research coming out of Nordic countries that's, that's another uh, template for what you'd like to be able to do. And again, they, they make use of administrative records. Um, one of the things that we're going to be trying to do, as you'll, you'll see, is we're going, to, we're going to characterize upward mobility in human capital, by, by which I really just mean education here. Um, and, um, and, and eventually what we'd like to be able to do is to look at contextual factors and ask, well, what, what are the kinds of things that cause uh, some places or some people to do better than others? And, and the Nordic countries actually aren't that great for that purpose because they're, they're all kind of uniform progressive states. and so. So that this is you know fantastic work, but there's definitely complementary work that can be done from from from, from this. All right. So what are we going to be doing? Uh, we're going to be using the uh, 1940 census, and just to put this in context, this is during this sort of golden age of increasing education. So so uh, golden cats, for example, track really carefully from census data what's happening to average education, and it was pretty amazing. Every decade, average education was going up by you know almost a year. Uh, for, for this entire time span. So, so we're, we're going to see lots of uh, uh, rising education um, with, the, with the samples. And what we're going to be doing, um, it, it sounds a little strange, but let me uh, uh, try to convince you it's not, not too, too, too uh, foolish. Um, we're going to be looking at 17 to 18 year olds in the, in the 1940 census. And these are going to be people who are still living with their parents. Okay. Um, we're going to also have a look at, at uh, there's a surprising number of 25 to 35 year olds still living with parents. So we're going to look at them too. Um, and, and we're going to end up with uh, very, very, very large samples when we do this. So we're going to be able to look at intergenerational mobility for, for racial, ethnic, immigrant status groups. Um, we're going to be able to uh, look, at, look at how this thing varies across the states. And so just to give you a sense of where we're headed here, this is a graph of, of the age of, uh, this is white women, we, but it's, it looks pretty similar for other demographic groups as well. This gives your age and then asks, do you still, do you live with a parent? Okay, so almost all the young people, of course, do. And then it's a little hard to line it up, but, but this, the 18-year-olds is this dot here. So about 80% of them are still living at home. And the 17-year-olds, uh, you know, 90% uh, of them are living at home. Okay, and if you, you, as you go younger, of course, more and more uh, are living at home. And actually, uh, white, white women are leaving home a little earlier than the boys are. So, so you'd see, you'd see these be a little bit higher for, for uh, Are the people not at home, are they, they're presumably the less educated? Uh, we could, we could, we can, uh, we can figure that out. Um, I'm, I'm guessing at the younger ages, that's probably right, they're getting married off at the slightly younger ages. Um, and my guess is there's, we, we, were, we were talking about this uh, last night, there's probably variation in my states, and might, might be something you could do with that. We're going to look at these 25 to 35 year olds uh, just in a second, and you can see this is a really select group. Okay, so well, how, how are they select? Well, uh, some of them are people who probably aren't doing real well in life, and so they're, they're stuck with parents. Some of them are just living on farms. That's 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 okay. You know, it's not not doing unusual. Some of them are people whose parents live with them. Okay, so um, you know, you see this in urban areas a lot, actually. So uh, you know, this is this is this is kind of a pretty weird group, um, and so let's look at them. So, so here we go. Uh, this is um, African American women, black women. So I'm just picking black women to, to show that we can. Um, you know, like, like no, nothing wrong. I mean, we we're going to be able to do really detailed stuff. So what we have here is, as you can see, uh, you know, I don't know, like 100, and, well, 150,000 um, women that are showing up. 
between the ages of 25 and 35 still, still living with a parent. That's the thing. And you know, we can look at the uh, parents' education. Now, the way we did parents' education here is we, we just said, uh, let's take the higher, if there's two parents at home, it's the higher education of the two, which is, in, in this case, actually usually the mom. And then, and then if there's just one parent, we take the education of the, of the one parent. Okay, so that, that's the way we're, we're doing parent education. And, and then we look at daughter's education, and you can see, like, um, that these things are really highly correlated. Okay, so that's, that's not really surprising. If your parent's well-educated, you're more likely to be well-educated. And, and why are we thinking 25 to 35-year-olds? Well, because education is probably pretty much completed by then. So that, that was the idea here. And, and again, it's a special group, but you can sort of get the sense of what's going on here. Um, if you wanted to measure upward mobility, what you'd be doing is you'd be thinking about those, those kind of blue uh, numbers that are in the upper right-hand uh, you know, quadrant here. So, uh, um, like, let's take this group. Uh, like, this is the biggest group here, as, as, as mom had between five and eight years of education in 1940. And then what you see is about 46% of daughters have more education. They've moved up at least one rung. Okay? But that would be a measure of upward mobility. Um, in fact, that's one we're going to use a lot, is it this exact one. We're going to take people between the ages, with, with, with this, whose parents had five to eight years of education, and say, do, do you have distinctly more education, A plus? Uh, but we could do the same thing for one to four. That's a pretty big group, too. And, and actually, if anybody wanted to, you could go ahead and do this all the way to the college. Huh? I mean, it's, the data's all there. All right, so. Can I ask one question about yeah, yeah, what sure. education means in 1940? I've been looking at the data and I'm wondering, is high school graduation, is 12 years something magical like it is today? Or do we think that it was kind of a continuum? No, it's, it's they ask it, uh, elementary education 1 to 8, high school 1 to 4. So it's it, it must be that, that that's that's the way they're thinking about it in the census. There's one state that had 11, South Carolina. Oh, is that right? Hmm. Yeah. But in terms of the meaning of the, the, the impact of having education, is it is there discontinuity if you have 12 years or do you not know? I, 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 I think so. Uh, but, but do you know, Dave? There's a, yeah, I mean, they ask it that way. Yeah, there's a, it was widely thought that that was a major milestone. Mm -hmm. It would be kind of equivalent to having a bachelor's degree today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, they ask it that way. You can still look on the on <coughs> form. But you're using greater than 12 as opposed to 12 or greater. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's right. That, 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 you could imagine doing it differently. Yeah, right. I, I see where you're headed. That, 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 that'd be a sensible thing to do, too. Yeah. Maybe a more sensible thing, come to think of it. <laughs> um, all right. That's why you give work at early stages. <laughs> um, but, so, all right. And then, and then oh, okay. Well, okay, wait. Look at these two right back to back. This is, this is a, a, a black woman. I'm going to do white women next. Okay. So, First thing you're going to notice is you're going to notice a lot more sample down here. And then the second thing you're going to notice is lots more upward mobility. All right, so the biggest group is still that five to eight, uh, you know, uh, uh, category. But there's way, way more women down toward the bottom end of, of women with high school uh, education. And the upward mobility is way higher. Like for that, that very group, this five to eight, there's, there's about 60% of daughters that have moved up the ladder. Okay, so that, that's the kind of thing that you could do with, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with people 25 to 35 year old. Again, remember, this is a special group, okay? So it's not, you know, it's not, don't think of this as population rep uh, representative. Um, as long as we're uh, uh, doing it, though, let's just, uh, you know, look at a bunch of different uh, groups. So um, here's a bunch of, uh, of groups. These are not mutually exclusive, okay? Uh, but we have, uh, you're asked if you're white, you're asked if you're Negro. And you notice for both uh, women and men, um, upper mobility is, is, in general, in the U.S. for this group, much higher for the, for the whites than for the blacks. So it's higher for the girls and the boys, or in this case, men, uh, women and men. Um, the, the, um, the folks at, at Minnesota have, have coded up Hispanic surnames, and so we could do those separately. It's kind of interesting. Um, you know if, if, uh, um, if the parent's foreign-born, and so if, if, if at least one parent's foreign-born, Looks like uh, upward mobility is pretty high, and if you're Asian foreign born, uh, the mobility is the highest. How about that? Kind of interesting. All the way back in 1940. And, and again, for this kind of special group, okay. Now our our, pro our concern is that these adults who live with parents are not representative. So as an alternative, what we're going to be doing is looking at 17 to 18 year olds, and you're going to say, well, wait, in the 17 to 18 year olds, they're not done with their education yet. That's true, but let's just flip back a, a bit. Um, some of the upward mobility we're interested in is like for these, these people, um, you know, mom had, you know, 
seven years of education. And so we can get upward mobility by the time you're 15. Right? We, we already know, are you going to be increasing? And so the 17 to 18 year old isn't sort of as crazy as it seems. It's not as crazy as it would be now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of, of, of people who are sort of fi finishing up by the time they're you know, 15 um, with education. So we can, we can do that next. And, and so what we're going to do is we're going to typically take two groups. Which, like the older groups aren't so interesting, uh, not older ones. The parental groups with higher education are going to be a little bit less informative because we expect their kids to go on to you know, possibly even to college. But for these ones whose, whose mom or dad have one to four years of education or five to eight years of education, those would seem pretty interesting. So let's just, let's just look at them. And, and what's the most interesting way to do this? Maths. Okay, so we did learn that from Jay. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so what are we doing? We're looking at upward mobility uh, among children aged 17 to 18 in households where parents have uh, five to eight years of education. And let's start with women. Um, here's a map for white women. Uh, the, the colors are prettier. Uh, much prettier on my screen. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, but uh, if you could, you could see this, what you'd see is, well, okay, these darker colors, the, the highest colors, upward mobility is 90%, okay, so all, almost everybody's upwardly mobile, and these really light colors are, are, are all the way down to uh, uh, under 20%. Now, what I'm going to do is just flip from white women to um, black women. And the main thing to notice is that, first of all, upward mobility is much, much lower. But what's more important and more interesting to us is there's much more geographic dispersion in, in upward mo mobility. Like, so it's way, uh, way lower in the south. To get a sense for this, um, upward mobility is as low as 20% in, in Mississippi. Okay? But it's, it's really high out here in California. And it's high up in New York. Um, uh, let's see. Let's try this for men. So here's uh, white men. And you can see, again, for white men, there's not a huge amount of, of geographic di di dispersion, but it's, it's, it's lowest in Tennessee and, and uh, my, my home state um, and, and Kentucky. Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, high, higher in, in the um, you know, Midwest and, and much higher in California. This is based on where they live or where they're born? This is based on where they live in 1940. All right, so they're 17 to 18 year old in 1940. Um, one, one thing we're gonna—I'll show you some regressions, but not the coefficients that you, you might want to see. Um, uh, it turns out that if you're born in a different state and migrated, that doesn't seem to make a big difference in this. Um, what about if the parents were born in a different state? Because you've got the children of the Great Migration here. Right? You, you, you do. Um, we talk them through. Not, not there, but here not you there, do. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so, so but by the way, look, look, at the, look at the contrast here. It's just stunning. Okay, so you, you observe things are a little worse in the South for white men. For black men, they're massively worse. And then your point is, these people up in Ohio and out in California are, 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 are migrants. Their, their parents are, are probably migrants. Um, yeah, um, it... It, the, especially, let's think about California. Um, uh, these are these are special people. I mean, so they, they came they came often from um, uh, from northern Louisiana. Actually, this is this is where they're coming from. There's a there's a big railway that cuts right through here, and then right on over to uh, L.A. Um, and so there's a there's a kind of big flow of these migrants coming over. So they're they're a little bit special. On the other hand, what's sort of interesting is upward mobility is, is really similar for uh, African American for for, um, for people who were born, for people whose parents were born in California and people who are migrants. So the ones who were born here may be special too, hmm. or there's something special about California. Um, yeah, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, so 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 uh, the, the the thing I again the, the colors aren't quite as good as what I'd, I'd hoped for, but but. <laughs> The thing that's interesting about this is, like, as you, as you flip from here to here, I'm just going to point out um, Ohio, just as an entry state, it, it barely changes colors. So it, it's one of these places where there's kind of a similar level of upward mobility for blacks and whites. But there's many states, like all the Deep South states, it's much, much lower for African-American men, for black men, than for white men. Oh, okay, then here's the Hispanic surname thing. Um, don't have anything more to say about it, it's just we can do it, so it's, it's sort of interesting. And again, um, in California, and in this case, uh, up in the Northeast, um, um, mobility is much higher for Hispanic-named uh, people than it is um, in, in Texas and um, New Mexico and Arizona, Colorado. So you guys could go below the state level? 
Oh yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Cal county, county, county level. Cal county level. Yeah. 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 That's the that's the next point. Mm -hmm. But so so far state level. Yeah. Um, back, back to James question. Can I just follow yeah. up? Is there a different interpretation of what we're seeing if we think of it as these are just state effects and you get the education by being there? And so if you move, you're just changing your state effect versus kind of intergenerational opportunity effects within states. Well, that's that's where we're headed. So so what what I'm gonna try to persuade you with all these maps is the states are different. And then what I'm going to try to persuade you in the second half of the talk is that the states are different from one another in kind of systematic ways. Um, but the, the, fir the first part's obviously true, <laughs> okay? So we'll, we'll focus on that. The second part's a little bit less obviously true, but, but I'm, I'm going to show you um, that, that there, there are differences across these states that seem like they are related to policy variables and contextual variables that matter to us. Um, and, but you're, you're, you're heading right back where? Okay, so this is the Hispanic name thing. Now, what I'm going to show you next is is um, a Japanese and Chinese. So mm -hmm. this is the first time anybody ever, I think, has looked at upward mobility for these two groups. So uh, how exciting is this? <laughs> so uh, I, I'm serious. I'm pretty. I'm pretty excited about it. So so let me just tell you how how this happened. The 1940 census, they they asked race, and and to the um, uh, the numerators, they gave very specific uh, instructions. You are to use one of the following categories. White, Negro, Indian, Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, Hindu, Korean. That's it. That's the full list. And um, if a person is uh, has parents of two different races, um, uh, uh, choose the one that's not white. Um, hmm. uh, and the only exception to that, um, the only one that they kind of worried about apparently, is what if a Negro is married to an Indian? And again, they're thinking Native American here. And then you uh, use Negro unless the person is well known to be Indian in the community. So that's the, that's the, that's the instruction. And by the way, if, if you're Mexican, how are you to be coded? White. Yeah, how about that? Okay, so Chinese, no ambiguity. People are going to just record themselves as Chinese or Japanese. Now, that, to put things into in, in context, um, we're trying to think, well, you, you can sort of see where this is all headed. Um, um, we're we're going to eventually kind of be looking at the quality of schools, like, you know, what, why, why were schools so bad for, for blacks and stuff? We sort of know this, and, you know, David's done a lot of work on this. But, but what about um, for, for, for Chinese? Um, I had no idea, so of course I looked it up this morning. And I got, <laughs> I got, I got this picture. Um, this is a picture of a school that's right down the hill from the Fairmont Hotel. Um, it, it was known as the uh, Chinese um, uh, primary school, and it was built in the late 19th century because by the late 19th century, uh, the idea was to, to go ahead and segregate uh, white kids from Chinese kids. That that was that was the plan, um, and it had a it had a lot of support in the newspapers. It had a lot of support from intellectuals. Um, there's a guy, um, uh, I did I did write down his name because because you'll know you, you you'll know him out here. Um, Hubert um, Howe Bancroft. <laughs> so 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 Mr. Bancroft was an uh, interesting character. Um, he was born in Greenville, Ohio. He he was born. His parents were abolitionists. Their home was a stop on the on the um, Underground Railway, and so Mr. Grant Bancroft was what a spectacular racist. Um, <laughs> it, it's like it's like such a sad thing the way these things work. So he <laughs> he he wrote extensively um, about the inferiority of, of both blacks and Chinese it was, was sort of equal venom, um, uh, kind, of, kind of interesting. Well, anyway, in that sort of environment, um, what happened is we have this this school, the Chinese Primary School. Uh, that was built in the late 19th century. You're saying it's like, no, wait a minute, I see up in the right corner there, it looks like it says Oriental School. That's true. So in, in 1906, what happened is, is somebody got to thinking, well, we better send uh, Japanese kids to school as well. And so they changed the names. And, and then, um, <laughs> then the, 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 the Japanese um, government objected strenuously. And, and San Francisco reversed itself. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, Theodore Roosevelt actually mentioned this issue in the State of the Union speech because he was he was worried that the Japanese were going to be sufficiently unhappy about the state of affairs. Well, in any event, what happened was at least the Chinese were, were put in, in segregated schools until the 1920s and 30s. This school was eventually renamed, and um, and by by the time our kids, the kids you see in the data, arrived, they were not going to segregated schools, but their parents were. All right, that's that's the way you can think about them. Um, well, we're going to see lots of, um, most of the Chinese are going to be in, in California, but not all of them. What if they were in Mississippi? 
Well, it turns out that in Mississippi, um, they had, uh, there, were, there were three options. Um, well, throughout the South, there were three options. There were only two options in Mississippi. In Mississippi, you either went to a, a black school or to a, a, a Chinese school. So there's a Chinese school from Bolivar County, uh, Mississippi. Our kids are going to be uh, 17 or 18 in 1940, so these kids in the back row, they're, they're in our data. Isn't that something? There they are. Um, yeah. Uh, there were apparently we don't we don't know anything more about this. We're gonna get, we're gonna track this down now. This seems pretty interesting to me. Um, so oh, and by the way, uh, why do we know that the, some of these kids ended up going to black schools? In 1927, there was one of these infamous cases that went to the Supreme Court. Um, Lum mm -hmm. versus Rice. Um, was a, a Chinese girl who wanted to go to a, a white school, and uh, it was ruled at the Supreme Court that as long as it was separate and equal, plus she could be sent to the black school. So. Mm -hmm. All right. So here it is: upward mobility for for Chinese men. Um, um, and we, we, don't, we don't have a map for women yet, we'll, we'll, we'll get one. Um, again, in, China, in, in California, it's, it's extremely high, like, like nearly 90%. Um, in Alabama, um, where there's, okay, you get at least 500 uh, of these young men had to show up for, for us to do with them in the map, but they still, you know, you can see they're showing up, and, and here it's ju just as low as it is for African American men. Is this the measure with um, parents? Five with it five is persons. same same thing. Yep. So, in the among the Chinese at this time, are the Chinese immigrants? Do they have that much education, or uh, they they they, 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 they do. I mean, there's some from one to four, and we can do those as well. Mm -hmm. um, this this happens to be the five to eight group, but yeah. yeah. And then and doing it once we do it regression analysis, we'll we'll, we'll get more observations. We can, yeah. So this and oh, and, and then. There's some Chinese uh, folks up in the Northeast, and they seem to be doing pretty well. So it's kind of kind of to track down who, who, who those are. Um, uh, Japanese men are all all on the uh, West Coast, and they all have enormously high uh, upward mobility uh, on the eve of World War II. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. So there's there's our maps. Okay, we can sort of summarize what we've learned. Um, and, and again, this is all just kind of bear in mind this is all descriptive. This is an upper mobility measure for people whose parents have education um, five to eight. All right, so now you have to have more than eight. You have to get, at least have some high school. And, and the thing is, it's lower in the South for everybody, but especially for African Americans. And it's higher in the West for everybody, including blacks. That's the thing. And that's something kind of interesting. Um, now, sad news is that almost all African Americans are in this bin right. during this era. And then for, uh, for the Chinese, Japanese, and I, I think uh, Sip Graham put Koreans and, and Filipinos in, but you know, they're a very, very small part of the group. Part of the group. They're almost all here. But that's, that's the big group. But you do have substantial numbers of blacks in the northeastern Midwest. No, that's right. And there, the, the parity is, is interesting. It is interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it tells you something's going on. Either they're, they're a select group, they are a select group, they're migrants. Um, and or there's something going on in the schools, which we're going to try to study in a minute. Um, yeah. uh, these are the, these are the kids in eighth, ninth grade. Uh, the proportion is attracted from basically the, the parents who maybe don't only the eighth grade. Correct. 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 So of course this is a difference measure. It depends on what the base is. So. Yeah. So. so um, if you come from a family or a group in which the modal Achievement is three grades. Well, well, it's not. I, I, whatever I, it is, whatever it is, you're going to have a bigger rate. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the issue of ceiling of four effects. No, 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 that's exactly right. So w w these are the parents have have five to eight years of education, so they're the same bin. But even within that bin, your points, I think, where you're headed is that among among the black group, they may be much close, more of them near five, and among the whites, more near eight. And that's that's not right. So eventually, what we want to do is a regression analysis, do it by year. But, yeah. It'll change things a little bit. You, you wouldn't think too much. Um, all right. So, uh, uh, so what, what's going on here? Well, you know, we're economists. So we'll sort of write down a, a, a little bit of a model here, and it's it's kind of in the same spirit of, as of actually Glenn Lowry's model. He does much fancier things than we do with it. But the point here is that parents care about what's going on today. That's the V1 thing, and so your consumption depends on your income. That's why. And and kids during this era could could, could pitch in on the farm, and so this W. W is just like like what what the wage is, how much pro product a 12 year old kid or 14 year old kid or 17 year old kid can produce on on the farm, 
And then 1 minus E tells you how much time is your kid in school. So I guess the way we're thinking about this is schools available up to, uh, you know, typically 10th grade or 12th grade in local communities, and how much of that do you take advantage of. So you, you can, you can um, well, you can sort of see how this is going to work. Um, what we do is we say, all right, well, what's that Y2 going to be? The Y2 is going to be the kid's income when they're an adult. I mean, you care about your kids. You want them to be happy, too. And, and maybe, maybe it's produced a cope according to a Mincerian production function. And what does a Mincerian production function mean? It just means that you get to take log of W, and it's linear in education. So that's, you know, it's what everybody does. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. And then, and then we want these to be real, real uh, uh, you know, a, a sensible utility function. So, of course, we can set them to be equal to the log. So I, you know, but the, the point is you get exactly what you think you're going to get, which is high-income parents just, just use full-time school. They send their kid to school until there's no more school to go to because their income's high relative to what the kid could be earning. And that would be true unless A is really low. Like if you really don't care about the future generation, go ahead and make them work on the farm. But, but that, you know, that, that's what ought to be happening. But for these, these guys, in example number two, what happens if you're, if you're poorer, um, you need that kid. I mean, bear in mind, this is the end of the Great Depression, and all hands on deck. Some of these, a lot of these families are really struggling. And so, unless your kid's getting good schooling, keep them home. Put them to, put them to some use. So that, that's sort of the idea here. And the, and the main thing that you notice is for these, for, for, for the, the first set of guys, these, these rich, relatively well-to-do families, school quality isn't going to matter at all. This return to education, which, which is related to school quality, surely. Um, but in the second case, it will. All right, so that's, that's just the kind of thing we want to have people bear in mind before I show you the next set of results. The, the, oh. the idea would be if the returns are really high, if the school quality is really good, then you'll, then you'll go ahead and do it? Yeah, so okay. the, the comparative study goes like this. It says, it says for relatively high income families or families that are really forward looking, and just parenthetically, my stop there, actually some immigrants are thought to be kind of especially forward looking people. And they, they sort of, so place a greater weight on their kids. That, that would work the same way here, actually. That's it, that, 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 a, a is bigger here. But in any event, for, for relatively well-educated, well high-income families, and ones that are really forward-looking, they, they just send their kids to school full-time. But then, now to your point, here's a comparative statics, and they just, just fall right out of it. That means it kind of is set up so it works this way. If you're, if you're, if you're not constrained to be full-time, <coughs> the higher your income, the closer you are to being constrained, the higher your, your optimal education, the higher your forward-lookingness, this A thing, how much you use to place weight on that, the, the more education you get for your kids. And then Q, that ha kind of has to be true here. Like, so if you think, like, I'm sending, I'm sending John to school, but he's in a classroom with 50 other kids, I don't think he's learning much, I might as well go ahead and keep him on the farm. If, I, if I've got a pretty good school option, I'm, I'm less likely to. And that, that's what that sort of last comparative static is, is, is getting at. Do you say anything about what, uh, that there may be a difference between the child's wages in different parts of the country too? Or sure, sure, farms? sure. So you, yeah, sure. So if you if you're if you're living on a farm, uh, the kid could actually do something useful. If you're if you're living in Gary, Indiana, a uh, kid can't work in the steel mill until he's 16. Which also and so yeah, and, and doesn't have anything else to do. So that, that that's right. That's that that makes sense too. So most most kids aren't living on farms by now. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, that's 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 exactly right. Well, but but the, but the main reason we sort of set it up this way is is that you sort of want to make a point that variation in school quality could, could matter, but probably is going to matter most for lower income families. And then and then there's also during this era these these compulsory schooling laws uh, floating around, um, and these these vary across um, states. Um, what we did is we used these compulsory schooling laws uh, that, are, that are coded up by uh, Stephens and Yang. And uh, it, it, it's a little bit complicated because there's a whole series of regulations and rules and age restrictions and stuff like that. But essentially, they sort of put, put states into categories where you, you, you're required to get seven or fewer years of school, eight, nine, or ten. That, those are the sort of basic categories that most of these laws fall into. So we're going to use those. And then as for school quality, um, th these data, uh, uh, Dave and Alan Kruger have, have a, a couple of pretty well-known papers, uh, extremely well-known papers from 19, uh, early 1990s, that, that where they code up the, uh, a bunch of school quality measures um, in the South separately for blacks and whites, and then for the rest of the country for, 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 for schools more broadly. And they, they know uh, teacher salaries, student-teacher ratios, and term lengths. And so those are, those are what we're going to use uh, for now. 
Um, uh, uh, who asked? Oh, yeah, we can do this at much more local levels also now. Now we have the 1940 census, but, but we'll just start with state level stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so what do we what do we find? Well, let's just get back to the maps. Okay, so remember our story is that school quality should matter more for for kind of the low end kids and the high end kids. So these are these are white men. And you've already seen this before, they, they're getting somewhat lower education in, in especially Kentucky and, and Tennessee and, and in the South. Okay, but these are the ones whose, whose parent has five to eight years of education. Now what I'm going to show you next is parents who had one to four years of education. So what's going to happen? Mobility is going to definitely be lower, because this is upper, upper mobility all the way up to eight plus. Oh, okay. So it's got to be lower. Okay. So it has to be lower. The kid generation is the same. Yeah, it has wow. to be lower. And actually, this is the one where I wanted you to focus on, 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 on Ohio, and I'll tell you why in a second. But what we, well, this is what we get. All right, so for these kids, regional variation matters way more. Okay, let me just go back and forth. Okay, this is, these, are, these are the parents who have a little bit more education, the ones who have less education and regional variation uh, is, is way bigger. And the reason Ohio doesn't change is Ohio required all these kids to, to get at least eight years of education. But now you've, you've changed the measure of mobility from getting more than your parents to actually an absolute level of it. To getting all the way up to eight. That's exactly right. That's, that's a different metric. It's a completely different metric. The, but the main the main point, whoops, sorry, uh, but the main point here is is not that it's lower. We would expect the upper mobility to be lower, it's that the regional variation increases. And our interpretation, you can see where we're headed, is this has to do with school resources. Um, or, or plausibly has to do with school resources. So, um, so how would we show that kind of thing? Well, this is literally a plot with the Carden Kruger data for, um, we started here with uh, black men, uh, you know, the black boys in this case, because they're 17 to 18. Um, and, um, and we're looking at the upward mobility. And um, we didn't make that plot up. That's really what the data tell you. So in, in the in the deep south, Mississippi, South Carolina, Louisiana, and Alabama, plus Arkansas, which we'll lump into the deep south just for this purpose, uh, teacher salaries are, are unbelievably low, and upward mobility is, is astonishing. 20% of these boys are, are doing better than their parent. Is the teacher salary data for all schools? Presumably the black schools. No, it's for the black schools. Yeah, but these are for the black schools. Yeah, we'll, we'll show you the white schools in a minute. Okay, thanks. Yep, yep. You can do it the other way around. You can do a teacher student, student teacher ratios. Oh, these data, by the way, are from 1936. So this is like when these mm -hmm. kids would be in school. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, look, look at this in Mississippi. Uh, a lot of these classrooms were bigger than this, okay? Because some of the schools were kind of small schools, kind of stuck in the middle of nowhere. So they only had 30, which means there's others where they must have had 70, 80 kids per teacher. And um, anyway, well, you can just sort of see what happens. Um, uh, here's the same thing for the black women. Same, same exact story. This, these are the deep south states. Look at Mississippi. Um, uh, uh, and then you can sort of flip the other way around uh, for, 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 for women, too, for girls. The uh, student-teacher ratio is really high in places like Louisiana and Mississippi. And it just kind of lands up pretty well. Uh, for, for whites, we can do this for, um, for the entire country, um, or at least most of them. Is that all 50 states, Dave? I guess it is. 48. We didn't have Alaska and Hawaii back then. Oh, we had DC, so it's 49. There you go. All right. <laughs> And uh, so you can still see the same, same kind of pattern. Here's, Mrs. Here's the Deep South again, so the white, white kids weren't doing all that well either, but upward mobility is higher for a variety of reasons, possibly having to do with composition, but surely, possibly, you know, surely school resources matter here. Um, you can flip it around and do the student-teacher ratio. Mississippi's still the worst, but now they have one, one teacher for every 40 kids. Um, North Dakota, South Dakota, they had small classes, didn't they? Uh, <laughs> What's going on there? Um, and you can do the same thing for, for, for the women. Um, so these are 17 to 8 year old uh, women. Um, and you get this upward sloping thing and the teacher salary and downward sloping thing and the, the student teacher ratios. <coughs> um, so that, that seems, that seems kind of compelling. Um, let's, uh, let's do this with regressions now. So, so we're going to just basically take those same data. Oh, oh, plus the school term data. There's also data on how long the school year went. So we have three, three majors. Okay, so let's see what's happening here. You've got 17 to 18 year olds who are living with their parent, and you really want to think of this as a censored regression. Because some of them are still in school, which means they're going to get more. And a lot of them, like half of them, are done with schooling. And for them, you observe everything you need to. So this is a classic case where we could feel pretty good about using a, uh, just a, uh, I guess this is a Tobit uh, kind of setup here. And um, uh, so, 
let's see what happens here. So, so now what, what we're looking for is, we, we just do all the groups, right? So this is, this is the parent had one to four, parent had five to eight, parent had nine to 12 and over 12. And so far we've only estimated these for white men and white women. Uh, but forthcoming we'll, we'll do something probably a little more elaborate than this, or at least a little different than this. Um, uh, we've included a lot of controls here. So, so we, we include the kid's age, of course, that's got to matter. And, and family structure, which, which is just, are there two parents present, and if not, is it mom, only mom, or only dad? Um, we look at whether you're urban or farm, uh, born out of state, because we didn't want to, we don't want this just to be kind of picking up migrants and stuff like that. Um, and then we could, of course, cluster these things at the state level, since our variation in schooling quality is at the state level. And you kind of see what we kind of thought we would show, which is, if the parent has a relatively, so think of these as being poor families, these school quality things matter quite a lot. It's actually the pupil-teacher ratio and the teacher salaries always kicks in. This is the same thing, I think, in, in, the, in the original carbon Kruger papers. Those are, the, those are the ones that really matter. And then as you kind of move up the educational uh, chain, um, it, th those things tend to matter a little less um, for, 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 for uh, um. Does the amount of variation in those variables change? Does he, the point of the, or the way parents have 9 to 12 years of education, they all live in communities with relatively high teacher salaries? It's all just at the state level. So, so, state level. Yeah. so given that all the maps you showed us had the kind of outcome variable did you get beyond eighth grade, why didn't you start with that regression? What the um, outcome variable was, did you get beyond? I mean, that would have been a sensible thing to do. Yeah. I mean, this is not to say that this is, not that this is no, no. informative, but it would have been a natural no, regression that, to expect. Sure. Yeah, that would have been a smart thing to do. Yeah, good plan. Uh, yeah, the sensor regression has a sort of disadvantage of being, um, you know, a little, yeah, a little black box. Yeah, yeah a little black box. Sure yeah, yeah, that, that would have been, yep, yeah. yep, I like it. I mean, you can also just regress, are you in school, and you could do that on all kinds of different ages. Oh, yeah, exactly. you could do that. Yeah. Right. Yep, yeah, yeah. that'd be a pretty good graph. Just yeah, exactly. Did you get me on eight, nine? We have, we have enough data, so well, graphs exactly. work really, really well. Right. That's a pretty good idea, too. <laughs> yeah. Could you just talk to us how we should understand term length? What is... What do you think is going on there? Oh, yeah. Uh, so term length is the number of days that a uh, kid was in school. Oh, and that's the mandated days, like, average yeah. mandated days of school in the city. Right. Yeah. Where the K-12 system is a whole. Mm -hmm. huh. And they vary. Some, in some states will vary widely across districts. Mm -hmm. By this time, mostly, it didn't, mostly it's a state law. Like, we have a state law in California mm -hmm. now. It's like 185 days. Right. That, that's that number. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the little, something a little weird is it actually becomes wrong signed over here. I don't take too much of it, but you know, we, have, we have more work to do. Um, hmm. but yeah, I mean, these are, all right, well, all right, so that's, that's what we get for the white men. For the white women, um, same, same deal. The pattern looks uh, kind of almost identical, um, uh, similarly. So, so for, for these, 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 these women coming from poor families, these, these variables matter um, a little bit more than they do for the, for the ones. Does the term length in your model increase the cost of the kids going to school. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you just run the regression of term length alone, it's always positive, but it's not mm -hmm. that much variability. Mm -hmm. The original reason we collected it was because back in 1900, there was a wide variation. Mm -hmm. And when we went to black and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. right. By 1938 or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not what I just do. This went back to this. Or I've been twice. I don't know which. Oh, compulsory schooling laws. That's yeah. what I'm doing. I'm zipping right by them. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so here's something else that might be mattering. Um, uh, uh, and, and in some ways, this is kind of a cleaner exercise when you think about it. So, so as I was saying, during this time period, um, um, what, what Mel Steffens and, and um, uh, Doyan uh, show is that um, is a I know other people have kind of worked on this, but I think their code is kind of the, the most recent. Is that states have like uh, six, seven years, or actually some less years of schooling mandated, um, eight, uh, nine, or ten. And um, I, I got to tell you, there's a lot. There, there are a lot of kids who have dropped out before the mandated grade. It's, just, it's almost like more of a suggestion in the states. <laughs> but it, 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 it really, it does work. I mean, it does, it does change things. For whom? 
for, for, the, for the kids whose parents are poorly educated. And this kind of makes sense. Like if you're in one of these, typically the more progressive states are the ones that have uh, higher mandates. And, and if you're a relatively well-to-do parent in one of those more progressive states, your, your kid's probably going to finish high school anyway, or at least make 10th grade. And so that's, that, you want to think of that as being these people over here. Um, so these are actually people whose, whose parent, one parent has at least some college. So that might not have been the smartest thing to do, but, but it's what we did. And these people have at least some high school, and now these mandates don't, don't matter much at all. It doesn't seem too surprising to me. This is interesting because it, it, get, it sheds, at a minimum, it sheds a little bit of, of, of light on what's going on if you use compulsory schooling laws as an instrument for anything. What, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be weighting these people. <laughs> and so it's, just bear that in mind every time you read a compulsory schooling that paper from now on out. It's, it's not, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's really something special. Um, and that was for, for white men, this is now for the white women, and you see the same, same exact things going on. These things bite, but they only bite uh, sort of, uh, you know, down in here. Um, what we, what we are, are planning to do uh, going forward is to try to, I mean, since the changes in these compulsory schooling lines that, that, that people have used, and we can't do this very well yet because remember, all I've shown you is like 17 to 18 year olds. And so there's, yeah, there's not, not much, very, there's no variation there to use. But I can just, we can just use this same trick. Uh, look at people who live with, with a parent. <laughs> so they're special. But look at, here we're looking at 26 to 40 year old uh, white men and women who live with a, with a parent. And you can kind of see what happens here. This, this spot right here, these kids from this cohort forward, should be, getting, should be getting eight years of education if they were following the law, mm. okay? And so before what was happening, uh, uh, these are well-educated parents. So this is like the eight-plus category, and these are the less than eight category, kind of split the sample in half uh, roughly that way. And you can see if your parent was well-educated, you were already up kind of around 95%. It's mm. kind of sliding up, and the law doesn't do anything in any event. Um, um, for these people, I, I think with these RD type of things, you're supposed to leave this one out. It would look better if we did. So <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. It's, it's, it seems like it's doing something. So I, that, I don't know. That, that sort of seems promising. And, and so what, what we're going to be doing, um, what, well, anyway, so here's, here's what we, we find, is there's a huge amount of variation in upward mobility. It's, it's much higher for, for whites and blacks. It's higher for immigrants and non-immigrants. So I, I showed you just a couple of numbers about that, but not much. So a lot of regional variation. It's much higher in the West, um, and it's as <coughs> uh, by considerable margins in the South, and especially for blacks. And we, we definitely show correlations, links with these education policies. Um, the, the schools, that, the states that vote more resources, um, you know, show higher mobility. And we've got just tons of work to do. So first thing is you can see we just kind of sketched out what the data tell us. Yeah, we don't, you know, our resource design still needs to uh, be beefed up here. We need to sort of think carefully about how to take those graphs and preliminary regressions and to put them in as things that are a little more careful. Um, uh, David has been working for years, I guess, coding up county level uh, variables on school quality. And so for some states, we're going to be able to do local variation. And again, remember the 1940 census, as I think folks here know, have this sort of incredible variation now <coughs> that we're going to be able to use. Um, and then we have this sort of longer term project. We, uh, uh, we have a, a, a application into NIH with Seth Sanders where we're trying to match say, all these children from, from 0 to 18 that show up in the 1940 census. We know stuff about their parents, a lot of stuff about their parents, race, education, and more than, than I'm showing you here, income, occupation, and stuff like that. So we had this idea of trying to take all those 1 to 18 year olds, so birth courts 1932 to 19, 1922 to 1940, and matching them with all the data we can find uh, from then on out. So the CPS, uh, National Health Interview Survey, uh, death records, stuff like that. Um, that's, so we'll see. Is this a earnings? Maybe. Um, so, so for some reason, uh, SSA views the AIME, this you know, the summary major, as not um, individual level data. Why is it not individual level data? Because there's some federal mandate that if you aggregate 15 or more things to construct something. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's aggregate data, and, and of course they aggregate uh, you know, 30 years of earnings right. for that thing. So maybe we put in a request. Um, hmm. We'll see. Um, so that, that'd, be, that'd be pretty awesome. Um, but that's, that's, that's all right. Great. to see many breakdowns by farm, non-farm, and by mobility, non-mobility. And the 
is you, you gave an interesting, I would say more sociological than economic story about what might be happening okay. uh, in the, these two sectors. It didn't lead you into talking about what are the right deflators to use. So on teacher salaries, there are a big cost of living differences among these places. And in the education sector, what a year of schooling meant must have been very different in cities than in, in farm circumstances. Yeah. So could you talk a little about farm, non-farm? <laughs> Big dichotomy. Of course, I can talk about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so early on. Okay, so all, all, all I can tell you for sure is if, if I had showed you more coefficients in, 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 in any of these regressions, but let's just let's come back to this one. We do a control for farm, whether you live on a farm or not, and as you can imagine, the coefficient on that thing is big time negative. So farm, farm kids controlling for parents' education are, are likely to not get as much schooling. So that's all we know so far. But your 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 your, your suggestions will take. I mean, it, 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 I, if you really believe our, our, our theory, um, farm kids ought to be more valuable around the house than non-farm kids. And so, mm -hmm. so you you th even think these coefficients might look different. That'd be, be a pretty sensible thing to try. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then for regional deflators, um, yeah, I, 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 that's actually something I've thought about a lot, not in this context, uh, and it's a it's a really hard problem. I mean, uh, so I thought about it in the context of the Great Migration. So you have a family in Mississippi. This would be a typical story. The family in Mississippi is making $400 a year. They move to Chicago, they're making $1,500 a year. Has real income gone up? Not at all, obviously, to me, that has. And it's really interesting. That's a hard problem. So, uh, I believe so we have sociologists here, you know, experts in this, but there's a, usually a big distinction between a change in the marginal distribution and a change in the rate of mobility and the kind of mobility controlling for the marginal distribution. When structural you show us versus the, circular. Right? When you, when you well, show well, us. Well, well, what's that called? Structural versus what? Structural versus circular mobility. Structural control versus circular. I don't know what this means, but well, it, I should it, know. I, I think we'll forward back to Josh in a second. But, but structural means every sort of the whole average level of education goes up oh. because of some. Oh, you do hand out certificates of graduation to everybody, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, right. uh, and circular means that people move from their relative positions or not. Yeah, right. So I guess I was wondering, in, in terms of the states, is, is is what we're seeing is that everybody is being benefited, say in California, um, and no one is doing better in Mississippi, or is it that uh, there's actually greater mobility? once we control for uh, the averages. There's, there's, there's greater mobility. I mean, so, so what's happening in California, like, so you want to bear in mind, like, these these maps here are like, uh, so this is white, white men, let's just pick the, I mean, well, it, it could be anybody. Oh, let's just do white men again. See, this is, this is fine, because we got, remember, you got these two groups. I mean, so th these are people who get to eight plus, right? And it's really high for everybody, like for, for whether you're five to eight, or, or, or whether your parent has a four, one to four. And Ohio is even better. Look at Ohio doesn't change color at all. The numbers are the same. So it's 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 really their school policies are really dragging the kids up from very low education families. But if but maybe the I guess my my it, it doesn't seem very controversial that if you pour resources at everybody that everybody goes up. Uh, uh, so so my, my question is: Do some does it do states differ in terms of the way they? Say increase mobility for the uh, uh, ch change the relative advantages and disadvantages of being less educated and more educated. Have, well, have parents. So you're, you're, it's a little, little bit preliminary, but if you if you believe th th this picture, if you believe these two pictures, the answer is is, is very much yes. So again, pick Ohio, and, and the reason I feel a little more confident about it is because that's the one where we've actually gone back and trying to see what compulsory schooling laws happen. But the point is, these are really poor families, and these are kind of poor families. Either way, these boys are almost all getting eight or more years of education, and that's absolutely not happening in other states. So in other states, those pictures change color, which tells you what? It tells you that the, you know, like, like take Louisiana. Louisiana is doing a terrible job with the, with the really poor kids. And they're doing a little bit better job with the uh, somewhat less poor kids. And so there's, there's big variation in prostates in that thing, too. That, that's the, 
you know, and, and, and again, with the caveat that these bins are kind of coarse, and you know, we can do better. So just where? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. So, uh, Go ahead. Uh, so my question maybe goes back to the motivation issue, uh, which is, is understanding the education. And two, I think some of the literature in sociology is getting skeptical about education, both as an interesting variable. Uh, well, it's interesting, always an interesting variable, but as a, sort of, uh, <laughs> as a variable that, 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 that has uh, uh, interesting effects on mobility. And in two parts, I mean, what is this thing we just alluded to, which is circular versus structural mobility? So if you elevate everybody's education level, one thing you can do is you can compress the difference between kids from poor backgrounds yes. and kids of upper backgrounds. But their, their relative position may just stay the same. So now the college graduates' kids are getting MAs, and the MA graduates' kids are getting PhDs, sure. and so forth and so on. Yeah. Which is very different than people actually being displaced in the relative, people dropping down from the relative position from above to below. So that's one thing that, and so you have, for instance, Mike Cowan used to be here, a paper called Maximum, Maximum Feasible Inequality, or something like that. Mm -hmm. In which he argues that basically school systems over time get rigged so that they're always the, the kids from the well-to-do families are always one step ahead, even if the average level of education is moving up. That's, that's one point. And related to that is, is a question of um, what is it, 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 it there, there are two related questions. So the other one is, is, what does it mean to have a certain level of education? And this is a historical uh, dimension, but also we could talk about regional dimensions. If what you have is that employers decide they're going to make high school graduation requirement to work on the assembly line, where 10 years earlier all they required was a grammar school education, but the job itself hasn't changed. And even the relative income hasn't changed. They've just increased the, the uh, certification need. Then uh, you haven't really changed mobility. And there's a certain literature on, on whether education should be understood in these terms, or whether education should be understood in relative terms. And so what you want to know is, is somebody in the top quartile of education, bottom quartile of education, and that quartile absolute number will change over time. And the last thing I'll say is, what it could do for your cross-sectional analysis here is that you can imagine whatever those dynamics are, are uh, uh, progress over time differentially. So that it may well be that the employer, the manual employer in Mississippi in 1940 wants somebody who can just read and write very simply. But at the same job in Chicago, the employer is asking because he can ask for a high school graduate. And so the meaning of year, what years means in terms of your ultimate uh, uh, economic opportunities is different. Yeah, so um, uh, to your first point, um, that education is always rigged to help the, uh, the kids at the high end, that seems right to me. <laughs> uh, but what I would say is it looks to me, just sort of working our way back to these maps, just look at these, these ones in California, is it seems less rigged, at least during this era, in California than elsewhere. That's interesting. So we, we, we've already just described specific examples where California was probably was far from progressive during this era, but, but, but more progressive than other states. So somewhat less rigged. To your, to your second point um, about the requirements, that, that seems really fair to me. Um, it could be that, so it's not as if African Americans subsequently did, did all that well here in California. So, so you know, maybe these, these, these young people got better education and then other things happened over the following 20 or 30 years that weren't, weren't so good um, here. And who knows if it has something to do with what you're, 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 you're arguing about, um, which is related to your third point about, my, about dynamics. Um, what I really hope we can do is, is get these these data match to the CPS and, and eventually to the AIME, and we'll be able to answer some more of your, your, your questions. I, I, have, I have strong priors on what we're going to find, I, uh, the, and, and it's in part from the previous work that uh, David and Alan did uh, years ago, and that is having higher education uh, is better everywhere, um, and it's especially better in places that have high quality schools. But, but you know, we, we, can, do, we can do more than, than what, uh, what these guys did uh, previously. But your, I mean, your, your, your comments were actually sort of uh, sound like it could be right out, the, right out of the debate around the Jenks report. So Jenks was like back and forth on this very issue. I, I've got a question that's sort of for now speculate, and then maybe you can do something with this later. Which is, um, what if, 
can you think a little bit about the, the role of sib size here? And I'm, I'm sorry, which sib size? So you've got oh, 17 to 18 yeah. year olds, but you also yeah. perhaps have their siblings. Sure. And some of those are going to be large sets of children and some small, and that's going to be changing over time. Yeah. Um, siblings, siblings are really, really, uh, really uh, good idea. And uh, uh, we're not only going to see siblings and families here, but if we're, if we're lucky, we're going to see siblings later on. So then you can kind of estimate these, I guess, like Gary Smolin's done some of this, where you kind of look at so That's a really good idea. Yeah. As, as always, the future ideas are the best ones. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we'll get to that. It, it, I, I really like the idea. So are you going to be able to join us for tea for more questions? Okay, so thank you so much. <laughs>